Welcome to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. Right now with me is Jack Barsky, who's got a book, Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. How are you doing today, sir? I'm quite all right. Thanks for asking. Okay, so let me ask you something. How do you become a KGB spy in America? Uh, very slowly, gradually, and it took altogether uh, about seven years of wooing and training before the KGB thought uh, I was ready to be launched. Now, where did you grow up? I grew up in East Germany on, on the other side of the wall. Um, uh, Soviet occupied, so to speak, yeah. and I uh, spent uh, my first 25 years there, uh, got educated there, even had my first job there, and then I took this massive detour via Moscow <laughs> into the United States, and here I am now a, an American citizen. Uh, quite a bit of a journey there. Was it usual for the KGB to recruit East Germans? No, that was probably more the exception than the rule, because the East, East, East Germany was... Uh, saturated with uh, Stasi. It, uh, they had about a, Stasi had a, uh, that's the East German Intelligence Service. Uh, they uh, they had about 100,000 uh, employees and unofficial collaborators, and at one point they had almost 2,000 secret agents in West Germany. So so the, the, the uh, KGB probably got a few plums out of Germany. What attracted you? Why did you want to become a KGB agent? <laughs> it's not something that I had ever dreamed of. Uh, you know, I actually, I never really knew what I was wanted to be. Uh, and But when I was approached and the opportunity opened up, there were a number of things that uh, came into play. First of all, I, I was ideologically as sound, in quotes, as you could possibly be. And, you know, I believed in the, in the communist vision and the ideal. And I also, another one in quotes, n knew that communism, world communism, was inevitable, and I wanted to help this along a little bit. That's number one. N number two, uh, even today I have a sense of, it, you know, I, I like adventure, I like new things, I like traveling, I, you know, I, I don't want to be bored, and all of that, you know, you combine that with... Uh, the, the flattery that comes with being recruited by the, uh, at that time, arguably the most powerful organization in, in the world, uh, that made for a pretty strong uh, recruitment pitch. You, you go through your training in Eastern Europe. You don't just walk off the plane here in the United States and say, here I am, I'm, let me get a job. How did it work? <laughs> there was another lengthy process. Now, I... I did come to the United States uh, with one thing, you know, with actually two things. Uh, I had a, a birth certificate uh, for Jack Barsky, which was a, a, a valid, authentic document. And I had enough cash on me to, to last me for about six months. Um, and um, with that, uh, I, you know, I, I moved it after I arrived in Chicago and after less a couple of days, five days, I went on to uh, uh, to New York, and there I proceeded to uh, collect uh, authentic United States documentation, uh, driver's license, social security card. The plan was also to get a passport, but that failed. Uh, I don't want to get too much into this right now, but, you know, it took me almost a year to get to the point where I had enough documentation to go and apply for a job. And since I didn't have a resume, you know, I would have had to lie, which is not something that you do if you want to stay un un undiscovered, undercover, so to speak. I started very lowly. You know, I was uh, for two, two, two and a half to three years, I rode the streets of Manhattan on my bicycle delivering packages. Now, how hard was it to get a job back then? No references, no, I mean, you have a social security number, but I can't imagine today, in today's world, getting a job just... With a birth certificate. It we, even was difficult then. That's why I started at the bottom rung. And it wasn't, and it turned out, it wasn't really a job. Uh, in, in, I worked as a contractor. I was on a 1099. I wasn't an employee. And they were always looking for people who, who were crazy enough and brave enough to run around in Manhattan on a bicycle. That's uh, it's rather risky. I don't know which one was riskier, becoming undercover agent or becoming a bike messenger. So that's how I, I got my first opportunity to, to make a living. Now, what was your job for the KGB? It wasn't delivering packages. <laughs> no. I, I was supposed to uh, 
primarily uh, gather political intelligence. Uh, that was, you know, ideally, and they were always dreaming, you know, if you could make, talking to me, if you could make connections with the, uh, you know, people who were highly placed in 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 the political arena, congressmen, senators, uh, you know, government employees, State Department. Uh, that would have been ideal for them. I was never in a situation, in a position socially to to make those acquaintances. Um, I also um, was um, um, I was told, and I did that uh, to you know meet as many people that might be of interest for future recruitment and uh, profile them. And then I did a whole bunch of uh, one-off things in, in, uh, that uh, that, were, that I could do because I was there and I could do things that uh, the uh, what, what I call um, um, diplomat uh, agents, you know, the resident agents couldn't do. Was there any other time somebody asked you a question that you were a little bit nervous about answering? You you afraid your cover was going to be blown? Well, the one question that came up, but uh, that came up repeatedly, uh, was uh, because my I, I was never able to get rid of my German accent a hundred percent. When people would tell me, you know, you sound a little odd. It sounds like you might be European. And I would immediately, you know, I was prepared for that question. I would answer this, uh, well, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, my mother was German, and I grew up speaking a lot of German with her. In New York, that was a good answer, because there's a lot of, uh, particularly Puerto Ricans, uh, who were born in New York City and have a heavier accent than I ever had. But all the other questions, interestingly enough, I... I sort of grew very slowly into American society, and so initially I wasn't really interacting with people who were very curious. And when I actually joined the rank of professionals, you know, I already had enough of a background and I was Americanized enough that uh, questions generally did not pop up. Now we're talking to Jack Barsky. He's got a book out, Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and... Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. Welcome back to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. We're talking to Jack Barsky. His book, Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. So what was your secret life? <laughs> well, if you pretend to be somebody you're not, that's as secret as it gets, no? Yes. So that's what that's what it was. You know, I literally, I crossed the ocean, and uh, I established a completely new identity that had nothing to do whatsoever with uh, who I really was. And I even had a family in back in Germany, and obviously I had parents and a brother, and I left a lot of friends. When I came here, I was brand new, and I was sort of born uh, in born again, not in the sense of the, not in the religious sense, but born again at the age of like 32 and started life as an American. So that's pretty, pretty odd, radical. Did you start a family here in the United States? I did too. Uh, that was more accidental than planned. Uh, if you want me to get into it, I, I, I can. Well, just briefly, you have a wife in Germany and you have a wife in the United States? Yes, I did. And uh, officially at that point, I was a bigamist. And that's the one thing uh, I'm the least proud of, you know, the whole, the whole, you know, enterprise of becoming an agent for what I eventually found out was a force of evil. It can't make you proud. But, but this one was at a level where I directly betrayed individuals who I actually cared about. You're in the KGB. I assume at some point you have doubts. No, uh, quite frankly, uh, political doubts, doubts about the viability of communism stopped sort of at the level where I, I was convinced that communism, communism was a good idea, that the Soviet Union was a force of good, but we had the wrong leaders. And quite uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of my handlers within the KGB had the same opinion. You know, uh, towards the, you know, the late 80s, uh, it's not a surprise that you know KGB personnel were highly educated, and they started uh, tending a little more towards what eventually happened in in the Soviet Union when Gorbachev took over with Glasnost and uh, Perestroika. So, but but fundamental doubts came only after I 
resigned from the KGB and, and the Berlin Wall came down and I was able, thanks to the internet, to do research and, and understand uh, what happened uh, behind the scenes that in those countries that we never knew growing up. Well, let me ask you something. How do you resign from the KGB? You just send them a letter of resignation? You almost hit the nail on the head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you, you normally don't do that, but I actually did send them a letter. Uh, this one was in secret writing, which is uh, an unusual resignation, uh, even more unusual than one time I resigna- uh, resigned from a corporate job by email, and my then boss told me that that was unusual. Well, you know, maybe I should have tried secret writing. But anyway... I, I, this was my last communication to them, and uh, because they wanted me to uh, return uh, back home, because they, for some reason which I have never found out, thought that my cover was about to be blown. And so since I didn't want to go, and uh, I wrote them, Dear Comrades, uh, I am not coming back. And the reason for that is that I have contracted AIDS and uh, uh, I will seek treatment in this country. Uh, This would be the only country where I could uh, even hope to hope for a cure. And I added two things. I said, I will not defect. I will not betray any secrets. And, oh, by the way, please give my German wife the dollar savings that uh, had accumulated on my account. And... They actually believed it because I know that they handed uh, the money over to my German wife and added that I actually had died from AIDS. Now, that wasn't such a stretch in in the late 80s. AIDS was uh, pretty much a virtual death sentence. You tell them you have AIDS, they just forget about you? They don't check on you? They didn't check on me. Now, you can speculate why. First of all... Uh, I had established a reputation as, as bare bone, dead honest. Uh, you know, they, they never caught me in a lie. Uh, and when, when I screwed something up, I proactively ad- admitted it. So I, I had, uh, you know, my, my reputation was pristine, number one. Number two, uh, this was 1988. Uh, the Soviet un- Union was crumbling at the edges, and I'm assuming that uh, KGB had more more important things to do than chasing after potentially a rogue agent uh, in in terms of like figuring out what to do when, when things change radically and it's not a surprise and when the soviet union broke apart and you know the goodies you know state owned uh, enterprises and, and factories and so forth were distributed that a lot of kgb uh, got the you know the majority of the spoils, so that's the explanation. You know, I'll never know. There's a possibility. There's some explanation for the, the question you just asked, hidden in the uh, KGB or the successor of the KGB archives, but that has not yet been um, made accessible to the public. What you do after that? After the 1980s? Well, I I already had it. Uh, a, a pretty good career going in information technology, and I kept on going with that. Uh, got into management, and even got into executive management. Uh, and I had a couple of positions positions as chief information officer, and so I made a pretty good living. Um, and even even after the FBI caught up with me, they allowed me to continue in these jobs. So so, and that's that's what I've done until about two years ago. Uh, I'm now officially retired from corporate America. How did the FBI catch up with you, and what happened when they did? They, there was a, they, back in the Soviet Union, um, there was a disgruntled KGB agent. He worked in the archives uh, of the KGB, and he got really annoyed for whatever reason and st- and started thinking about how he could do damage to the organization. And so what he did is he he copied um, files by hand onto small pieces of paper uh, that he smuggled out in his socks and then transcribed them in his home and buried the stuff in a milk can. And when he had enough, I think it was around 1991 or 92, Two, he initially uh, approached the CIA, uh, telling them what he had, and they sort of said, "We're not interested." Uh, 
I bet you the fellow who said that uh, didn't have a good career after that. Uh, he eventually uh, got a got more receptive ears at uh, MI5, which is the British uh, equivalent of the FBI. And so he arrived in England with a, a suitcase or a couple of suitcases full of documents. And among those documents was were, was a small section that says Jack Barsky, undercover United States, and a couple of other information that eventually wound up uh, with the FBI. And the FBI did a search on Jack Barsky. There are not too many of those. We're not too many of those in the country. And they found me rather quickly. And then they started an investigation. It, it took them three and a half years to eventually um, go in for the kill, so to speak, and actually introduce themselves and detain me briefly. Uh, they were very cautious because they, the FBI and the CIA uh, had suffered some significant damage um, of uh, had molds within their respective organizations, and the FBI was concerned that uh, that I might be running, still might be running somebody within in the government. Uh, and they knew that I was really, really well trained. So their their investigation was a, was done very cautiously and from a distance until they eventually figured out that I was not active anymore and the best way of getting something out of me would be to just to, you know introduce themselves and so that's how we became friends eventually what what would have happened to you if you were caught let's say in the uh, early 80s this is not that hard to predict i would have uh, um, okay there's a dividing line up until i had a child in the united states what would have happened? They would have put me in jail, and I would have uh, I would have not cooperated, knowing that the Russians would eventually get me out. Uh, the KGB has always done that historically. When they had one of their men or women, for that matter, in jail, they would find a way to exchange them for somebody that they were holding. So I was ready to go to jail. Now here's here's a, it gets a little speculative, but uh, in 19 87, uh, Chelsea, my daughter, was born, and let's say if they had gotten to me in 19, say, when Chelsea was a year old, before the Russians had called me back, and if they had tried to turn me then, uh, that's a tough one for you, for me to, to figure out because this is hindsight, but there was a possibility I, I would have become a double agent just uh, to be able to... For the same reason I stayed back here, which is to take care of this child. Uh, but again, that's a bit speculative. All right. Now, outside of the fact it's a good story, why did you write this book? <laughs> okay. First of all, it was my children who bothered me like crazy. Daddy, you've got to write a book. And I didn't get any traction initially. And then, then I was discovered by 60 Minutes. And, you know, here I was completely out in the open at this point, um, I figured it might might well be a, a good idea to tell the story in my own words, and uh, rather than you know, rather than having ex to explain to people you know my story over and over and over again, and you know you want to make some money too. I did. Uh, I did. Uh, uh, my, I lost my last corporate job. And so, you know, I, meet, I need to make some kind of income. And so there's multiple, there's multiple uh, layers of motivation here. Uh, it turned out that sometimes, you know, when, when you make a big change in your life and you make the change for one reason, then usually other things come up to say, well, you made, a, you made a good decision. You know, I get to... I get to meet a whole lot of interesting people these days. I get to talk to people like you. I, you know, I've made contact with ex-CIA, ex-FBI, and a very, very highly placed ex-KGB uh, individual, uh, history professors, uh, you know, um, Christian philosophers. You name it. You name them. I meet them, and the book sort of opens the doors like a key to so many doors, and, and my life has uh, become very, very, very interesting. Okay, well, the name of the book is Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances, Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America by Jack Barsky. Jack, thank you for being on our show.